weathering the storm. Vermonters are rebuilding in Florida after a devastating storm. Plus, uninhabitable islands, New York's governor is helping those nearly wiped out by Irma in the Caribbean. Animals were rescued from several states after Harvey and Irma made landfall in the U.S. I'm Lauren Maloney alongside Chief Meteorologist Sean Parker. We are interrupting your normal programming with this special report on this what has been a devastating storm season and what you can do to make a difference in the recovery efforts. First there was Harvey, then Irma, both with their own problems and challenges that Texas, Louisiana, Florida, the Carolinas, Georgia, and many more are now cleaning up from. Some from our area lent a hand to help with recovery efforts. Others did their best to survive the storm as it brought wind and rain. We'll be sharing some of those stories with you and also asking for your help. Yeah, we're partnering with the American Red Cross and we're making it easy and secure for you to make a donation. You can make a difference and aid in the recovery efforts. We start now with some Vermonters living in Florida who are staying in the Sunshine State during Irma. Our Alexandra Leslie caught up with Michael Brown via Skype after he and his family returned from a shelter to survey the damage. For Michael Brown, this weekend was unlike anything he's experienced before. We went to a shelter down in Palm Harbor and almost 24 hours, and that by itself was, was quite an experience. The former Vermonter and his family left their home in Hudson, Florida for the weekend ahead of Hurricane Irma. But as the wind calmed down, they decided to return home Monday morning to assess the damage. Some flooding, downed trees and branches, but their home is otherwise untouched. A lot of people are breathing a sigh of relief on just how quickly and dramatically Irma downgraded. Michael has been lucky enough to be able to make calls, though our Skype conversation was a bit hard to hear at times. I'm not sure if you're able to hear me okay. Cell phone reception has been shoddy at best. He says the city won't be up and running anywhere from three to ten days. Well, there's no gas stations, no fast food, no Walmart. All the supermarkets are, are closed down completely. Traffic lights are out. Um, I've even seen billboards that have completely toppled over. Vermont's Governor Phil Scott says VTrans is prepared to help out in Florida. The agency has worked out different scenarios and plans over the weekend. Trying to take down debris, move debris out of the, the uh, roadways, and uh, we're pretty good at that. So we have uh, a number of teams that we've assembled, and if they uh, would like us to, to come, uh, we'll, we're prepared to go. Right now, Green Mountain Power officials tell me they have not been requested to go to Florida, but it and other Vermont utility companies have offered. GMP officials also say they're tracking Hurricane Jose to be prepared for that as well. Definitely still a lot of work to do. They're working very, very hard. I think they said 19,000 crews are out fixing everything. For now, he's taking it day by day. We're expecting much, much worse, and we're really fortunate that it just died down, so a lot of people are relieved. Alexandra Leslie reporting. We also spoke with some students from the Lerner College of Medicine at UVM. They stayed at St. Mary's Medical Center at West Palm Beach during the storm. Another Vermonter who also weathered the storm, Emma Patrickwin from Hartford, Vermont. She was trapped in her dorm at Ave Maria University. Ave Maria is about 30 miles from Naples on the coast. She told us plane ticket prices were inflated, so she wasn't able to make it home. Emma said the dorms are built to withstand a Category 4 hurricane. Now, those who weren't in Florida at the time are now doing what they can to help pick up the pieces. Members of St. Catherine of Siena Catholic Church in Shelburne gathered for usual Sunday Mass this day with victims of both Harvey and Irma on their minds. The church is donating its collections to Catholic Relief Services. We also got to put our faith in action. So we, um, we take up collections um, to send down to um, folks that are there on the ground to help them with supplies, food, you know, all those things that they can hopefully rebuild their, their homes and certainly rebuild their lives. And so we see uh, very much, even though it's, you know, states away from us, that we're connected very much by, by our concern for them, by our love for them, and by our prayer for them. Now, this isn't the only church that's offered to help after a hurricane. Earlier this year, the Catholic Diocese also collected money, which will go to Catholic Charities USA and get filtered through local Catholic charities in affected areas. 
We have another way you can help. Visit MyChamplainValley.com and click the link on the top of the page. That's right, Sean. It's easy and secure. Of course, you can also visit RedCross.org or call 1-800-RED-CROSS. A Pennsylvania man is back after going to Florida to help out pets in need. Matthew Kerr decided to make the trip and bring his boat with him filled with pet food. For three days, he helped the Humane Society comb through neighborhoods for strays. They searched at night because animals hid during the day. He did say there have been cases where pet owners have tied their animals outside to fend for themselves during the storm. One of the animal rescues around where I live at, they donated a good bit of food. I have cat food, I have dog food, and you know, that's, that's the key to get down there and, and save as many souls as possible. You know, there was a lot of hotels and motels down there who weren't accepting animals, so a lot of animals got left behind to fend for themselves, which, I mean, how are you gonna fend for yourself when you're tied to a tree? The disaster res response team for the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals helped relocate, rescue, and shelter more than 1,200 animals affected by Irma. Irma. This is according to the ASPCA. Now, conditions from Irma also uprooted a huge tree in Savannah. This massive oak slammed on top of a home near the intersection of 53rd and Habersham Streets. Fortunately, no injuries were reported. Another tree right down the street fell onto the road. That blocked traffic for hours. President Donald Trump visited Florida September 14th, handing out lunch in Naples. The vice president and first lady were also there. Mr. Trump said they love the people of Florida who were hit by a storm the likes of which no one has ever seen. All you have to do is look at what happened in the Keys, but we love these people and uh, we're going to be back and we're going to help. And, and the job that everybody has done in terms of first responder and everybody has been incredible. And, and by the way, that includes the people that live here because you see the people immediately getting back to work to fix up their homes. The president also visited Fort Myers. He did not go to the Keys last week. Yeah, this season's going to be one we talk about for quite a while. And Irma itself will have a lasting impact, but in ways you may not have thought of. Diane Lee explains why the storm will leave some exposed to health issues. You want that baby duck? Yeah. Enjoying a quiet weather day after Irma's chaotic visit earlier this week doesn't come without some repercussions for the Marshall Flores family. Yeah, she has been sneezing, and I know it's just the allergies from the Irma and kicking everything up with the wind, and my husband's the same way. He has bad allergies. Dr. Jaime Lago says Irma has left a trifecta of troubles for allergy sufferers. The weed pond has been stirred up to very large uh, levels and therefore they're, they're getting hit by the weed pond. And on top of that, we have a lot more moisture, which is causing the mold spores to be produced at much higher levels. Add to that the pollen, and it can make any post-storm cleanup unbearable. But there's also another irritant. Yeah, the mosquitoes. They're all over my yard right now. It's, it is pretty bad. Uh, actually, this is enough water to potentially harbor mosquitoes. Drew Jeffers with Clemson Cooperative says all that rain and no frost makes for a resurgence in mosquito breeding. As if you need another reason to spray repellent, there's been seven confirmed human cases of West Nile virus in South Carolina this year, including one death in Anderson County last month. Getting rid of standing water and stocking up on antihistamine can help you get through the next few weeks. Say have a nice day. The Marshall Flores family has loaded up on boats so they can focus on enjoying the outdoors after being cooped up for days. FEMA is now taking on the task of helping states move forward. Our White House correspondent Mark Meredith has a closer look at how federal resources will be deployed to help. Floridians are facing power outages, flooded streets, and wind damage, but President Trump says they won't face it alone. These are storms of catastrophic severity, and we're marshalling the full resources of the federal government to help our fellow Americans in Florida. Those resources include millions of dollars in disaster relief and military support. FEMA's acting deputy administrator, Katie Fox. And we've got pre-staged commodities. We've got millions of liters of water, food, um, you know, shelter, supplies, toddler kits, all those sorts of things. But Fox says the agency is still deciding where to send supplies. Hurricane Irma has left 5 million Floridians without power. In the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, 4,600 service members are supporting relief work. Homeland Security Advisor Tom Bossert says more help is on the way. The, the mobilization of our military in response to the, the storms in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands is the largest ever mobilization of our 
military in a naval and marine operation. President Trump says he wants to visit South Florida soon, but the White House has not said if and when that trip would happen. While there is so much attention focused right now on the immediate aftermath of Irma, FEMA officials stress this is a recovery that will take years. There will be a huge amount of infrastructure damage given the winds and storm surge and everything else, and uh, all of those things really can take years to, to recover from for communities. FEMA tells us it has the financial resources to handle Irma's aftermath, but it could be several months to figure out exactly how much money is needed. In Washington, I'm Mark Meredith. Governor Cuomo sent 100 members of the New York Army National Guard's 105th Military Police Company and 30 members of the state police to the U.S. Virgin Islands. Cuomo traveled there himself to survey some of the damage on the 15th. Our Morgan Mackay explains not everyone was on board with the trip. Governor Kenneth Mapp of the U.S. Virgin Islands was formerly an NYPD officer and born in Brooklyn. So he invited Governor Andrew Cuomo to visit the area today to assess some of the damage after Hurricane Irma. We have so much family connections throughout New York State that come from the Virgin Islands. It's not a surprise to me at all. You know, he'll spend more time on that airplane than he did in Hoosick Falls when we had a water contamination issue. As Assemblyman Steve McLaughlin explains, since Governor Cuomo is traveling over to the Virgin Islands in an official capacity, New York taxpayers will be the ones paying for this trip. It's a lot of money. He's bringing a whole bunch of state troopers with him for security detail. That's a lot of money uh, for that. Um, plus the actual cost of the trip, all funded by taxpayers, and it just appears to me just another example of grandstanding. However, Assemblyman John McDonald disagrees, saying that New York in a way is a country leader and is the best state to step in and examine ways to help. New York State has always been one to reach out and help other states and territories in time of need. New York Army and Air National Guardsmen are also spread pretty thin, helping out a number of states, including Texas, Florida, Mississippi, and Louisiana. But this part is not bothering too many legislators at the Capitol. In America, you come together and you join forces. I get that. I understand sending people to help. I don't understand a governor going down there for a photo op. It fits in the mission of what New Yorkers are all about, is taking care of individuals in time of need. Governor Cuomo says he will be sending whatever additional assistance he can to the impacted area in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Reporting from the Capitol, I'm Morgan Mackay. Two emergency response vehicles went to Florida September 16th as part of the Red Cross efforts. So far, more than 80 volunteers have already been deployed to Florida, Georgia, the Virgin Islands, and Texas. Now, New York Senator Chuck Schumer is pushing for a new law to keep us all connected when cell towers fail and power lines go down during major storms. It would require every cell phone carrier to carry all signals during emergencies. The Sandy Act would also assign property calling, priority calling, to 911 services, start the process to provide 911 services over Wi-Fi hotspots, and then direct FEMA to play a larger role in the aftermath of the storms as it related to down power lines and cell towers. Now, Sean, we saw all of these storms really start in about the same place. Yeah, right there, just off of the coast of Africa. And really, hurricanes and tropical storms and tropical depressions can form anywhere in the tropical Atlantic in the Pacific. But over the course of the past couple of weeks and months, we've seen areas of low pressure. They're called tropical waves. Scoot westbound off of the Atlantic, off of the African continent, and from there, it works with very warm water and very light winds in the tropical Atlantic. And we need water temperature of at least 80 degrees, not just at the surface, but several hundred feet down into the water. Thunderstorms start to form in this environment. And there's also weak wind shear, which is the winds in the upper levels of the atmosphere. If they're too strong, they'll tear the storm apart from the top, from the top to the bottom. So those thunderstorms form in this warm water in this light wind environment, and they'll organize into a tropical cyclone. From there, the storms will meander to the west, and where they interact with the United States, if at all, gets dictated by other weather features, highs and lows. Weather features cannot move through one another. So say this ridge of high pressure, just for this example, right over Bermuda, will dictate whether the storm goes into the Caribbean or if it, it takes a turn north into the Atlantic. And Lauren, trying to predict weather features like this, it's, trying to it's like trying to predict a traffic jam. You're right, it's really wait and see. After so many tragedies around the world, many are left helpless without the resources or training to help. But one University of Vermont club isn't standing by. They helped those affected by Harvey in a unique way. 
Our Haley Boulay explains. As Hurricane Harvey neared the coast of Texas, the University of Vermont Humanitarian Mapping Club was hard at work throwing a party but not the kind of party you would think. Uh, first thing that happened when, when Hurricane Harvey hit is we uh, looked at the available data in the area. The available data is on open street maps, a website similarly to Google, but without certain restrictions. Google is a for-profit company that doesn't share their data very much. So what we're trying to do is create a data set that anybody can access without any red tape, at all. So once we actually do the edits at our mapping parties, it's uploaded onto the OpenStreetMap, which is kind of like the Wikipedia of maps. Anybody can edit it, anybody can download it for free to use for whatever purpose they, they'd like. This data can be used by relief workers and agencies such as the World Bank for damage assessment or disaster recovery. Get a better sense of how many buildings were affected, the size of the buildings that were affected, the roads that were affected, these sorts of really critical information for um, aid. In Houston, the club discovered deficiencies in building data. So the group got together, took satellite images, and mapped out the specifics that aid workers can use for better accuracy during storm recovery. There weren't enough buildings data sets to be able to really quickly do uh, certain types of analyses for damage assessment, figuring out how many buildings are in the flooded area, that kind of stuff. And hurricanes aren't the only natural disaster that the UVM Humanitarian Mapping Club has assisted with. They've also helped with the Ebola outbreak as well as the malaria outbreak. As for the party they threw, it's called a mapping party. 25 students got together to map almost 4,000 buildings in Houston, and they did it in just two hours. Haley Boulay, Local 22 News, Burlington. The mapping parties were open to all UVM students and also to the public. Houston police remembered a veteran officer who died while trying to drive to work in Harvey. Steve Perez left his home at 4 in the morning after Harvey made landfall, but after two and a half hours, he called his commander and said he couldn't get through. He tried to get to a closer station, but was never heard from. Houston's police chief said his wife asked him not to go, but he said, we've got work to do. A 12-year-old boy in Plattsburgh did his part in an inspiring way. Sean, you know I love this story. Our Rebecca Reese on his very special reason for paying it forward. Hi, Matthew. Hello. I'm collecting donations for Hurricane Harvey. Meet Matthew. He's 12 years old and lives in Plattsburgh, New York. Matthew decided to help those affected by Hurricane Harvey in Texas, following in the footsteps of his older brother and friends. Well, 12 years ago, they went around for Hurricane Katrina asking for donations with a wagon. There's another hurricane that's really bad that I should go around asking for donations. With. Matthew was also inspired by his own experiences. He was diagnosed with a mitochondrial disease and chronic intestinal pseudo obstruction. I get sick a lot, and people. <laughs> and the people sometimes really helped me out, so I thought that I should help people out. But Matthew's medical conditions haven't affected his heart of gold. He hooked up the wagon to his power chair and hit the neighborhood to ask for donations. Matthew has since collected many canned goods and raised about $150 for the American Red Cross. If I was in a situation like people in Texas, I would want someone to help me out. Paying good deeds done to him forward to people affected by Hurricane Harvey. Oh, the biggest high five to Matthew. By the way, he wasn't the only youngster helping out. No, about a dozen kids in West Wisconsin spent their last days of s summer vacation hard at work. The kids ran a lemonade stand and gave the proceeds to the victims of Hurricane Harvey through the Red Cross. They took turns giving it out and said they hope those in Texas have enough money to buy what they need. Anyone who bought lemonade also got, get this, a Pokemon drawing. <laughs> We have made it easier for you to donate uh, to the Red Cross. Visit MyChamplainValley.com, click the link at the top of the page. It's easy and most importantly, it's secure. Yeah. Of course, if you, can all, you can also visit uh, RedCross.org or call 1-800-RED-CROSS. Now, speaking of, a team of volunteers, not from the Red Cross, but speaking of people that are helping, uh, a vol team of volunteers from Oh My Dog took a truckload of donations to Texas, and they arrived home safely with just with a few extra visitors in tow. Yeah, 34 dogs were relocated to Vermont from Houston and Dallas-Fort Worth. The dogs were in the Texas shelters before Hurricane Harvey hit. Now there's a 30-day hold for any animal rescued from the disaster to allow families a chance to be reunited with their pets. 
Down south, because of Hurricane Harvey, dogs have a limited amount of time in the shelters um, before they unfortunately are put down. Um, so in you know, saving some of these dogs from shelters down there, we're making room for Harvey dogs while also saving lives. All Breed Rescue says nearly all have been adopted. And some good news in Maryland, where animals rescued from Harvey's floodwaters are finding forever homes. Yeah, here's Amy O'Bear. There we go. For Lisa App, fostering dogs isn't anything new. That's all she wants. Someone to feed her and love her. When she heard that a truckload of dogs and puppies were arriving last week from outlying areas expected to be impacted by Harvey, she wanted to help. I said to my husband, how many can I bring home? They ended up with three. Sassy, Sav, and Z. The trio, like many others in their group that arrived at Last Chance Animal Rescue just ahead of Harvey, are thriving in foster care. Of the 80 that arrived last week, four month old talk here is the only one left looking for a home. This is only the tip of the iceberg, unfortunately. The rescue is expecting about another 80 pups to arrive from the flood areas this week. Kind of taking a leap of faith that people step up and help foster. With so many more animals expected, they spent Tuesday packing foster bags and hoping to fill the need. Every puppy I bring home is a spot for another puppy to be pulled and rescued. Rescued from the floods and surrounding areas, hoping to find a loving family to call their own. We're gonna find you a home, find your friends some homes. Mm. And more dogs, four dogs rescued in Texas, were taken to Pennsylvania and they were in foster homes right after they got there. It was a 36 hour trip to bring them. Meet Lab Shepherd Mix Abilene. The four month old puppy joins Houston and two other dogs at Pity's Love Peace. Houston is a yellow lab mix around 10 months old. The other two dogs include Katie, a pit bull, and Dallas, a boxer pit bull mix. The rescue decided to help since they had openings in foster homes. There's going to be a lot of, of heck Texas dogs making their way to the East Coast, not just with our rescue, but with other rescues. So it's going to be crucial for people to, uh, to, you know, to step in and adopt, give them homes. Piteous Love Peace says it will be a couple of weeks before the dogs will be ready for adoption. Now, as of this week, Red Cross Communications and Marketing Officer Lloyd Zeal was still in Texas. This is video, though, from August 27th when even volunteers had to be airlifted into the flood zone. We talked uh, with Lloyd not too long ago. We've got uh, uh, somebody on the way over to the shelter here from a local church. She and her mother are bringing over um, her four-day-old baby that uh, she just had during this torrential storm. Hundreds have attended boot camps where the Red Cross went over what to pack as well as what to expect. Shelters there were holding over 1,000 people, which is much larger than volunteers are used to seeing in our area. All of these people, unless they have uh, a, a license in the mental health or the health services area, are going to be deploying to work in shelters. And so we talked to them about how we organize a shelter, what they kind of should expect, what our rules are for protecting our clients within a shelter, how we handle things. And we talk a lot about how they can help people, how they can interact with people. If you're interested in learning how to volunteer for the Red Cross, go to MyChamplainValley.com. And remember, you can help in the recovery efforts by donating any amount to the American Red Cross. We made it easy and secure. Visit MyChamplainValley.com. Look for the donation bar at the top of the page. You can also go directly to RedCross.org or call 1-800-RED-CROSS. Now, the Vermont Task Force 1 is back from its mission in Texas. Governor Phil Scott tweeted September 10th, welcoming home the 16-member team. The crew, mostly made up of firefighters from around the state, were working very closely with local and federal groups. The governor tweeted the state is ready to assist and definitely has when it comes to Irma. Governor Scott was at a reception with New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu on August 31st. Former Governor Jim Douglas was also there. During the event, Governor Sununu applauded Granite Staters and their willingness to help citing the recent success of the telethon. We, we talked to the administration down there and said very clearly, right now it's cash, to be honest. 
We're, we're sending some, some small materials that can be organized with the National Guard, but it's really cash they need right now to make sure that FEMA and the Red Cross and groups like that can do what they can do. So whatever you can do to help those folks out, it really does make a difference. We Sununu says Harvey is a problem the nation will face for years. And our friends to the north are sending help to Hurricane Harvey survivors. A flight from Canadian Forces Base Trenton took off with donations and supplies. Cribs, baby bottles, mattresses, and other necessary items will be delivered to San Antonio, Texas. It is an essential flight. I know they're hurting down in Texas, and I know a lot of uh, people down in the U.S. are, are uh, gathering all their supplies and trying to go help out, so I'm glad we can be a part of it. And here's a really neat way one business is helping out. A brewery in Colorado has stopped making beer and started canning water to send to Houston. Just seeing the utter destruction and everything that you've ever owned um, being wiped away in an instant is pretty, um, it's, it's hard to, to look away from that and not want to help. This particular brewery has helped with other situations before, including Flint, Michigan, when that city's water supply had high levels of lead. Brewery also assisted hurricane victims in South Carolina in 2015. Now SUNY held an online statewide collection drive to help the victims of Harvey. Governor Andrew Cuomo says cash donations will be used to buy supplies that then will be delivered to Texas aboard SUNY Maritime's training vessel, the Empire State 6. Click on this story on our website if you still want to donate, and we think you will. By the way, something you should be aware of before you make that donation. Because, unfortunately, scammers try to capitalize on a natural disaster. A lot of scammers use this as an opportunity to get people, especially when there's emotions running high with such a terrible natural disaster. Here's some things that you can look out for if the so-called charity doesn't have a website or any record online. That's a big red flag. And if, there's, if there is a website, but the pictures look pixelated, they may have been taken off another website. If something seems off, you can always contact the Better Business Bureau directly. Some of the biggest names in entertainment turned out to raise money for people dealing with the aftermath of these big hurricanes. They took part in a telethon last week titled Hand in Hand, a benefit for hurricane relief. Initially, the telethon was organized to help people in Texas and Louisiana, but then, as you know, it expanded to raise money, of course, to victims of Irma, which struck parts of Florida. Damages from the two catastrophic storms are estimated between $150 billion and $290 billion, really numbers we can't comprehend. That star-studded telethon, by the way, raised more than $44 million. Remember, you too can play a pivotal role in the recovery and cleanup efforts. Donations made to the Red Cross can be directed to help victims, families, and everybody impacted by Harvey and Irma. We made it easy for you. That's right. Visit our website, mychamplainvalley.com. Click the, click the link at the top of the page. You can also go straight to redcross.org or call 1-800-RED-CROSS. Now, on behalf of all of us here at Local 22 and Local 44, we thank you for watching.